Welcome, everyone. And for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, this is uh, our Riggs Library, the original library of Georgetown University. We are the oldest school of international affairs in the United States, so we like to be in a room that sort of evokes that ambiance. Um, we're so glad to welcome you here to this event today um, as part of the second summit for democracy. Just last week, um, we recognized the one-year anniversary of the death of Madeleine Albright, who sort of taught here and was a part of this community for 40 years, and it is so meaningful for us to be able to be one of the many organizations that's hosting um, the Summit for Democracy, really and honoring her legacy and her commitment to democracy um, over the years. Events are happening all uh, through the all over town this week, um, and this in particular conversation about the threats to democracy posed by hate fuel violence um, and how the U.S. government has responded is, I think, particularly important. Today's Discussion will also importantly look ahead to where we see the evolution of the threat going in the years to come and draw lessons from America's response for other democracies confronting similar challenges. We certainly, of course, as we know here, aren't perfect in our own country. We have our own real challenges with hate-fueled and political violence here located right as a university right here in Washington, D.C. Events like January 6th, the violent insurrection feel so real to us. So this conversation is sadly as relevant as it has ever been in this place at this time. So to lead us in this conversation with an extraordinarily distinguished panel of guests, we have our own Bruce Hoffman. He's a longtime thought leader and recognized global expert um, on terrorism, both at home and abroad. He's been a distinguished professor in our security studies program. He led the security studies program for many years and more recently um, has been the head of our Center for Jewish Civilization. He's currently working actually on a project about far-right terrorism in our country, which makes him the perfect person to lead this event. So let me hand it over to Bruce and look forward to a really fascinating conversation. Thank you for joining us. Great, thanks very much, Joel. Uh, it's a great honor both to moderate this panel and to introduce our very distinguished uh, guests. Let me start at my far left. Mary McCord is Executive Director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection and is a visiting professor at the Georgetown University Law Center. She was previously the Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the US Department of Justice from 2016 to 2017 and before that, the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for National Security from 2014 to 2016, and then had a two-decade career as a federal prosecutor. She's also a graduate of the Georgetown University Law Center. Next to her is the Honorable Jay Johnson, who served as Secretary of Homeland Security from 2013 to 2017, and prior to that as General Counsel of the Department of Defense, as General Counsel of the Department of the Air Force, and as an Assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. In 2020... And honorary degree recipient. And on, yeah, absolutely right. I, but I didn't see that on your bio online, but that's absolutely right. Uh, in 2016, I think. 2016, yes, absolutely. But also, I was about to mention your award um, in 2021 uh, when you were honored with the American Lawyers Lifetime Achievement uh, Award. Uh, Next to Secretary Johnson is the Honorable Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, who is currently the Homeland Security Advisor to President Biden a post she has held since 2021. Dr. Sherwood Randall previously served as the Deputy Secretary of Energy and before that as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European Affairs on the National Security Council, as well as the White House Coordinator for Defense Policy, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction and Arms Control during the, President, during the administration of President Obama. During the Clinton administration, Dr. Sherwood Randall was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Uh, she also has considerable experience in academe, uh, having taught and held research positions at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and also at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And finally, uh, on my left is Dr. the Honorable Dr. Joshua Geltzer, who serves, as the national uh, serves on the National Security Council of the White House and is Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Homeland Security Advisor. He was previously Senior Director for Counterterrorism on the National Security Council during the Obama administration. 
In addition to his law degree, he also has a PhD from the Department of War Studies at King's College London, where he turned his PhD thesis into the excellent book titled U.S. Counterterrorism Strategy and Al-Qaeda, which was published in 2010 by uh, Rutledge. Uh, if we could start with you, Mary, I wonder if you could give us uh, an overview of the, the state of the threat to our democracy from hate and intolerance in the United States today. So I'm typically the rain cloud in the room, and I'm going to, uh, you know, live up to that reputation. Um, and I'll start with some some statistics. So FBI Director Christopher Wray has now, for several years running, been in his testimony uh, very clear that the most significant terrorism threat here in the homeland is from domestic violent extremist terrorism. Within that category racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism, or RENBI it's sometimes called, is uh, the most significant threat. And within that category, white racially motivated extremist violence is the most significant threat. This is all followed closely by anti-government and uh, unlawful private militia extremist violence. So what Director Ray says regularly when he testifies about this is backed up by data um, that the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL, has um, uh, published every year. Every year they do a report on murder and extremism in the United States. And sure, sure enough, for uh, last year, um, the ADL reported that white supremacists had committed the greatest number of domestic violent extremist murders in, in most years, uh, in fact, since they began um, keeping data in 1970, and in 2022, it was 21 of the 25 domestic violent extremist murders were linked to white supremacists. But mass shootings and murders are only tell a small piece of the story of hate-fueled violence. Um, last year, the Center for, study, for the Study of Hate and Extremism put out its report to the nation. It called the 2020s the dawn of a decade of rising hate, its report said that hate crimes in the US were up in 2022 for the fourth straight year. The most frequent dark targets, blacks, Jews, the LGBTQ community, and Latinos. But as well, anti-Asian hate also remained high in 22 after setting record levels in 2021. ADL's most recent reporting showed a 36% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in 2022 over 2021, the most on record since ADL began tracking. And as the end of October of 2022, the Armed Conflict Location Event data set, or ACLID, had recorded nearly 200 anti-LGBTQ plus incidents, an increase of three times over 2021 and 12 times over 2020. But hate crimes and hate incidents only tell part of the story. And I could continue to give you statistics until your eyes glaze over, but let's talk about what's really happened and what is continuing to happen. So we could go back much farther than 2020, but even if we just start in 2020, right, we began with rhetoric about COVID, calling it the Kung Flu, which directly uh, drove the, the, this precipitous rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. That was followed by insurrectionist rhetoric about governments and, and uh, particularly state and local governments' policies to try to combat the pandemic. This resulted in armed standoffs uh, in state houses, armed attacks on state houses, Lansing, Michigan, Boise, Idaho, multiple other places, ultimately resulted in a plot to kidnap and assassinate the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. That was followed by the murder of George Floyd, which uh, spurred racial justice protests across the country, and in fact, across the world, the vast majority of which were peaceful. There was some violence, particularly noteworthy in a couple of major metropolitan areas, but there were protests and demonstrations that were peaceful in cities, small cities, Sandpoint, Idaho, Broadway, Virginia, t entirely peaceful. Yet in response, again, to disinformation and rhetoric about violent anarchists coming to pillage and loot and riot, we saw an, a huge rise in unlawful private militias, self-deploying, ostensibly to protect property, uh, oftentimes with lethal results, such as the killings in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And then, of course, there was Stop the Steal. Uh, the, the false narrative about a fraudulent and rigged election began long before the election. That false narrative ultimately led us to 
January 6th as the justification for committing an insurrection, actually rising up violently against the government to pre prevent the peaceful transition of power. Now that, um, that is all hate-fueled, right? Some of it's hate based on race or ethnicity. Some of it's hate based on politics and against the government. But it's still all hate-fueled. Uh, Robert Pape, a political science professor at the University of Chicago, has recently done a, a deep dive into those who participated in the attack on the US Capitol on January 6, 2021. He said, in fact, that over half came from states that had actually were sort of blue, had voted for Biden. These were, these were uh, most, the most common feature of those who came and participated in that attack is that they came from places where the white population was decreasing the fastest. These are people who were buying into great replacement theory, which was being promoted not just in social media, but in major mainstream news. Uh, buying into even the QAnon theory, not so much that there's a satanistic cabal of pedophiles, but pedophiles, but into the theory that um, the deep state government and Democrats are immoral. And when you put um, distrust in our elections and concern about being replaced uh, under great replacement theory with the idea of an immoral government, it leads to what we saw on January 6th. Now, post January 6th, we've seen a very different strategy, a decentralized, localized strategy. And this was, in fact, uh, put out, uh, it, it's been put out in many places, but an extremist platform called Gab, last May, um, uh, wrote the words that I continue to, to quote when I speak at events like this because I think they're so powerful. Capture your local county, then several of them, then maybe your state. We need to take the concepts and values of nationalism and decentralize them to our backyards, a decentralized and localized Christian political movement. Now here you hear it. They're cloaking themselves in Christian nationalism as a cover to hate-fueled violence and intimidation. It's just like cloaking themselves in patriotism in the, and the flag and fealty to the US Constitution, which we also see as cover for hate-fueled violence. And we've seen how this has played out. We've seen threats against local school boards and teachers for the teaching of race and history. We've seen threats against record numbers of threats against election officials uh, who are blamed for uh, rigging the elections, for counting votes of dead people, for double counting votes. We've seen attacks against those running for office, and that is people from both parties running for office attacked uh, if they were not willing to denounce and deny the last election. We've seen the targeting of the LGBTQ plus community and drag events for grooming children based on uh, disinformation about grooming. We've even said this, seen this targeting now against librarians for having books in their collections that are gender affirming or doctors who perform gender affirming care. We've seen attacks on Jewish people based on old tropes uh, that have been, we thought were long gone, but are not, and they are repeated by celebrities and uh, those sometimes invited to have dinner at Mar-a-Lago. And as this happens, we're starting to see uh, that opposing groups, when they see the violence on one side of politics, and they see militias coming out heavily armed to protect that viewpoint, we're starting to see that come up on the other side as well. So for example, at a number of the recent anti-drag protests where militias have deployed, we've seen militias on the left deploying as well. Here we've now got two ideologically opposed, heavily armed groups um, infringing on the rights of all to participate in their own free expression. And there's been the insidious creep into political, offices. We've seen extremists running for school boards, including some who've won when they don't even have children in the public schools. A militia member in Washington, three for center, won her race, no kids in public schools. We've seen them taking over county boards. We've seen them taking over local party politics by extremists, pushing out moderates. We've seen them ingratiating themselves with 
law enforcement and the military, and particularly adopting and becoming close with the constitutional sheriff's movement, a movement of sheriffs who believe that they are the highest law in the land, that they can decide what's constitutional and, and what's not, and they will enforce only those laws they think that are constitutional. Um, you might say, okay, well, getting involved in politics isn't that what democracy is about, and if the popular will uh, supports this particular political viewpoint, isn't that what we wanna see? Well, that assumes that it's voluntary popular will. That assumes that it's not a takeover in the face of AR-15s and high capacity magazines. That assumes it's not a school board meeting with a line of proud boys in the back of the, of the room uh, or people trying to go and petition their governments having to go past a gauntlet of militia members with AR-15s. That assumes that we do things voluntary. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, right now is a threat to democracy, and it is fueled by hate. Again, whether it's racially motivated, ethnically motivated, politically motivated hate, or anti-government hate, it's hate that's fueling it. Today, I'm honored to be here with all of you, and we will be talking about what the US government's doing about this, what the administration's doing about it, but I think it's pretty clear from just this data, it's gonna take way more than the US government. It's gonna take a whole of society approach, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit as well. well thanks very much for that uh, overview. Um, of course, two decades ago, we didn't have a Department of Homeland Sec Security to help keep us safe. Um, Secretary Johnson, we're fortunate to have one now, and of course, under your leadership, it continued to grow and expand in its mission. I wonder if you could describe the trajectory of DHS, both under your leadership and as well in recent years. Thank you. Um, is this, yes, this is on. Um, Mary, thank you for getting us off on that cheerful start. Um, I um, am awed by the talent up here on this stage. I wonder why, how I got here. Uh, the person to my right, for example, is one of the best and brightest in government today. Um, I assure all of you, uh, there's never been in the history of Georgetown a degree recipient, honorary or otherwise, who had so many Ds in high school. Um, so DHS, and I have been a witness to the evolution of the terrorist threat over the last 20 years myself in government and how DHS has tried to keep pace with that. As everybody knows, the Department of Homeland Security was created in 2003 by an act of Congress in 2002. The 20th anniversary of DHS was this month, 20 years ago. For the longest time before 9-11, we in this country believed we did not need a Department of Homeland Security or a Ministry of the Interior or a Department of Public Safety because we had two oceans on both sides to protect us from the rest of the dangerous world. That thinking all changed on 9-11. But the thinking in 2002, <clears throat> first of all, DHS, like everything in Washington, was a political compromise. In some respects, we went too far. In other respects, we didn't go far enough in this massive realignment of government. But the thinking in 2002 was that terrorism was an extraterritorial threat from beyond our borders. And if we simply did a better job of keeping the bad people out of our country by consolidating into one cabinet level department, the regulation of all the different ways somebody can enter this country, land, sea, and air, TSA, Border Patrol, Customs, Coast Guard, we will have effectively dealt with terrorism, the terrorist threat to our homeland. And for a number of years, that thinking was the principal way in which we went about our counterterrorism mission. And so even by 2009, when I became General Counsel of the Department of Defense and Liz was at the NSC, we spent a lot of time focused, as had the Bush administration, on what we referred to as terrorist-directed attacks on our homeland, preventing foreign terrorist organization from beyond our borders, directing large-scale attacks here in the United States, like 
like the attempted underwear bomber, December 25, 2009, uh, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, the UPS package bomb plot. And over years, we have done much to degrade and decapitate that type of terrorist threat. And beginning in around 2013, 14, and principally in 2015 with the rise of ISIS, we began to see foreign inspired attacks on our homeland where the foreign terrorist organization overseas in Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq would on the internet inspire lone wolves here in this country to engage in smaller scale attacks though the individual terrorist attacker had never been to a training camp overseas had maybe not even ever met a single other member of that terrorist organization but had been inspired on the internet to conduct terrorist attacks. When I was in office, that was the principal threat we were concerned about when I was at DHS. And I spent a lot of time on our CVE mission, encountering violent extremism, um, which I think, frankly, was of limited success. It was somewhat controversial, but we did it anyway. I probably went to just about every major metropolitan area in this country uh, to meet with the community, to meet with law enforcement, to talk about this, this mission. And toward the end of my time, by 2016, Congressman Benny Thompson and others began warning us and reiterating that there's also a domestic-based terrorist threat to our homeland as well. And that has obviously been the case. It is more complicated. The the way the Department of Homeland Security right now is configured, it is not well equipped to deal with a domestic-based terrorist threat. There are not a whole lot of DHS cops running around the interior of this country looking for terrorists, contrary to what you might see on TV. That task at the federal level has fallen to the FBI. And if you talk to people at DHS today, the principal terrorist focus is on intelligence and analysis, intelligence collecting. Ken Weinstein, who is a very experienced, skilled public servant, is now the undersecretary running INA. And the information sharing between the federal government and state and local, the volume of it has gone up dramatically to, to try to address this, this terrorist threat, which is a good thing. Ultimately, uh, in my judgment, the most effective way, the single most effective way to talk, to deal with what Mary talked about is, is gun safety. Gun safety. That is the common thread running through all the dangers we face, whether it was Nashville yesterday or San Bernardino in 2015, and all of the other things that we add to the very long and growing list of tragedies, senseless deaths. Um, we are, guns are part of our culture in this country. Our, it, it's woven in, it's enshrined in our constitution. I have been around enough Arizona ranchers in my time in office to know the virtue of owning a gun to protect your family if you're someplace remote on the border. I was in Arkansas last week and I asked my driver, what do you think are the number of Arkansas households that own a gun? And he said 90%. So guns are part of our culture. But no constitutional right is unqualified. You don't have a right to keep a surface-to-air missile in your garage. Uh, no right, whether it's a right to free speech, right to confrontation, the Sixth Amendment, uh, freedom of religion, no right is unqualified. And we simply have to get over the all-or-nothing thinking about gun safety in this country. We can protect someone's right responsibly to own a gun while also banning assault weapons in this country. That is the single most effective tool we need, we have to try to combat the terrorist threat and the threat to everyday Americans. And I know our president is committed to that and talks about this over and over again. Thanks to both of you for that excellent foundation. Let me now turn to doctors, uh, Sherwood Randall and Geltzer, to tell us what the Biden administration has 
done to counter these threats and to counter the proliferation of hate and intolerance in the US? I think it's automatically on. Oh, it's automatically on. I was looking for the turn on. So Josh and I are going to do this as a duo. I want to begin by thanking you, Dean Hellman. Thank you, Bruce, for welcoming us uh, here, for organizing this wonderful panel. I could spend all day listening to each of my colleagues and to you, Bruce, and would like to learn more from each of you. I have learned a great deal, both from Mary when she served in government. We sat across the table in the Situation Room quite frequently. Jay as my Dustin. colleague when he was at the de Defense Department and then, of course, when you were Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, and my role actually parallels the evolution of the Homeland Security Department. That is a Homeland Security Advisor to the President uh, was created after 9-11. And the space in which I work has always been occupied by uh, those who have served previously in this role and focused principally on, on uh, terrorist threats from overseas to the homeland. Uh, that The job has morphed enormously, especially in the last uh, years uh, since I departed from the end of the Obama administration and really has taken on a whole new uh, set of uh, challenges in light of what's happened in our country. Uh, you said since 2016, Jay, I think that's probably about right, although we saw there have been precursors and predecessors, certainly. Um, I thought I would begin by framing this presidency uh, because the uh, time we have spent in service in this administration has been very much defined by the domestic terrorism challenge. Uh, of course, the president has spoken about how he was inspired by Charlottesville to run. He was debating whether to run, and that experience of seeing what happened in the streets of Charlottesville um, and the chants in that dark night, uh, Jews will not replace us, blood and soil, uh, animated his decision to run. And his, he was inaugurated exactly two weeks after January 6th. We came into office with that completely unprecedented effort to overthrow an electoral outcome uh, so vivid in all of our, it's not just our minds, I mean, it was so present for all of us, we couldn't get into the White House. Josh was reminding me that when we arrived uh, to begin our service, we couldn't even park around the White House. We had to be dropped off at the zoo and we were bussed to the White House because there were so many uh, obstacles that had been put in place after January 6th with anticipation that there might be a second effort to overthrow the election outcome during the inauguration. And there were roadblocks, barricades, fencing. And so we began our time in service with that uh, physical presence demonstrating uh, what we had just uh, survived as a nation. In the first week of the presidency, as he uh, convened the uh, national security team in the presidential daily briefing, he charged us with building a team internal to the White House focused on domestic terrorism, um, including undertaking a one-month all-source intelligence assessment, a comprehensive threat assessment. Mary has given you some of that today uh, in an unclassified format and the development of a first ever national strategy to counter domestic terrorism. I reached out to a number of colleagues in this field and asked who I should recruit to lead that effort. He's sitting next to me here today. Josh drove this process for six months and then we persuaded him to stay on to do not only that work but a lot of other work as well. Um, importantly, um, in that moment as the president charged us with this mission and ever since in numerous discussions, with his team in the White House, with the Attorney General, with the FBI Director, with the Secretary of Homeland Security, with the Secretary of Defense, he's reminded us that in the United States, the fight against terrorism has to be very different. We could go overseas and, and focus on high value targets, remove terrorists from the battlefield in the homeland. We have laws we have to abide by that are fundamental to our democracy. And if we violate those laws, if we, for example, trample First Amendment rights, we will actually stimulate the very phenomenon that we are trying to counter. And so in everything we choose to do, we have constraints we face, which we have to wrestle with in order to get this right, land it in the right place, and advance the goal that we have of strengthening our democracy and reducing the threats from within. 
So we've tried every day since then to get that balance right. We've lived through so many incidents uh, that demonstrate the virulence of hate and the normalization of violence uh, that has taken place in this country uh, and is spreading in our land, as you've noted. I'll just list a few of them. Uvalde, Buffalo, Atlanta, Colleyville, Monterey Park, Highland Park, and of course yesterday in Nashville. In most cases, we see a toxic cocktail of alienation, some online mobilization, hatred toward the other. Mary, you mentioned great replacement theory, and often depression. Um, and this is on a continuum, on a spectrum that we see from the individual acts that may be horrendous, tragically, the uh, person who shot six people, killed six people in, in Tennessee yesterday, you can draw a line from that individual anger and use of weapons that should not be on our streets, assault weapons, uh, to the normalization of violence as a trend in which a growing percentage of our population believes it is acceptable to use violence to achieve their political ends. So that's a very substantial change. That's some of the research that you quoted uh, by Bob Pape um, that indicates that there is this growing number of Americans who think it's all right. Uh, and um, if this grows like a cancer, my view is that this will be the end of our democracy. It will kill our democracy. And so that is what we are up against. And the president has spoken to this very explicitly. He said most recently in Philadelphia, we're literally at a defining moment for our democracy in which we must all speak out and say there is no place for voter intimidation or political violence. Our democracy is premised on the notion that we use ballots, not bullets, to determine our future. And in fact, Americans have fought and died all over the world to preserve that right for others, that right to express yourself through a ballot. So this is a matter of national and generational importance since I'm speaking to so many young people today. Each of you has the responsibility to use your voice. Each of you has the responsibility to speak to your peers and remind them of what is at stake here, which is the future of your country and the future of American leadership in the world because what we have led with has been our values. We have tremendous power, the greatest military power the world has ever known, but what we have led with has been our values. So preserving those values, preserving the essential elements of our democracy is what this is all about for us and why we're doing the work that we're doing, uh, which I'm going to ask Josh to describe as he sets forth the three pillars of the national strategy that we developed uh, to counter domestic terrorism and secure our homeland. Thank you, Liz, and thanks, Bruce. Thanks to, to all of you for being here. Really an honor to be with this group and, and tackling this, this important topic. So um, guided by exactly the, the principles Liz has, has laid out so, so well, we did release in June of 2021 the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. And that first pillar of the strategy is all about what Secretary Johnson was speaking to, finding ways to generate and share more effectively, more speedily, more widely, understandings of this type of threat in a way that's actionable. Because just as you said, Secretary Johnson, so many of those in the domestic terrorism category tend to be individuals, lone actors, or maybe small groups who can be part of simmering hatreds online or otherwise for an extended period of time and then move with little or no warning to violence. How to warn about that rather than a elaborate multi-month plot involving actors outside our borders, that has taken work. And I think DHS, the FBI, other parts of our government have in implementing the strategy done uh, an admirable job of adapting to a especially state and local law enforcement audience hungry for that type of information. The second pillar of the national strategy is about prevention efforts. This is the, the, always the goal, to prevent individuals from getting to the point where they are in law enforcement, uh, law enforcement's problem in a sense, and their lives are irrevocably changed. Uh, we've invested heavily within government, 
with state, local, territorial, tribal partners, and critically, with non-governmental partners in prevention programming. And we can talk more about what some of those programs look like. The, the, the big, the mantra for those is that they are most effective the more local they are, which means they will look different in different communities. But we have seen the Department of Homeland Security utilize a greater set of regional actors, people who can actually get into communities and figure out who it is in those communities best place to determine who is radicalizing toward violence and then who is best place to offer alternative pathways. The FBI has been part of that effort as well. The third pillar of the strategy is about law enforcement because some individuals will become law enforcement's problem. They will be investigated and where appropriate, they will be prosecuted. And here, very early in the administration, the then acting Deputy Attorney General, John Carlin, issued a memo that went to federal prosecutors and FBI field offices across the country, indicating that to the extent they were looking at facts that met the federal statutory definition of domestic terrorism, they should bring those investigations, bring those matters to headquarters, to Maine Justice, so that the experts there could work with them on developing the right type of approach, aggressive but defensible, the same way they long had done so for international terrorism cases. And Mary was uh, critical of that effort, indeed led that, that effort from the National Security Division. What has since happened is the National Security Division has created a domestic terrorism specific set of prosecutors within the counterterrorism section so that when those inquiries come in from U.S. attorney's offices, from FBI field offices, there's a dedicated expert group of, of lawyers to, and, and FBI officials to work through those cases, drawing on best practices and lessons learned. Um, there's also a, a part of that third pillar that's all about vetting and screening those who come into the federal family, the federal workforce. To be a functioning democracy, we as a government need to give some people access to weapons, to training, to very sensitive intelligence. We need that, but if it's given to the wrong people, it will be exploited and abused. And the strategy called for developing ways that make sense for each part of our government that faces this challenge to improve how they vet and screen whom they bring in and whom they retain. And you've seen since the release by the Defense Department in December 2021, by the Department of Homeland Security in spring of 2022, of their own ways of implementing that charge. Then there's the fourth pillar of the strategy, which is about long-term contributors to this threat. And we are eyes wide open that these are not things quickly or easily solved, but it also would be wrong not to mention that they feed into the domestic terrorism threat as we encounter it today. And one of those is the widespread availability of certain types of firearms, as Secretary Johnson said, that simply make an act of domestic terrorism more likely to be lethal and more lethal when it occurs. But it also includes things like racism that fuels so much of, not all of, but so much of the strands of domestic terrorism we see today. And Bruce, maybe in conversation we can come to some of the ways we've broadened, in a sense, the effort since. Because since the, the release of that strategy in June 2021, we've tried to tackle almost concentric circles of the problem. We convened at the White House last summer, a United We Stand summit, deliberately taking to heart the point Mary made, that this has to be bigger than government, bringing in experts, researchers, corporate leaders, nonprofits, the tech sector, all of whom stepped up and made commitments to try to reduce hate-fueled violence. We have since announced that we are developing a national strategy for countering anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry and hatred, because right now the federal statistics are that anti-Semitism uh, is responsible for more acts, more hate crimes uh, than any other uh, form of bigotry or hatred. Uh, we should also talk a bit about a website we just released that brings together for the first time over 100 resources on violence prevention from across uh, all the parts of, of the federal government. All of these, in a sense, take our efforts to tackle domestic terrorism, hate crimes, hate-fueled violence, and that broader spectrum that Liz spoke to of other forms of violence and recognize that they are a persistent threat right now and we need to do more as part of a broader community to tackle them. Thank you. Let me put it in an independent advertisement for this website, which really is a remarkably important step forward. Um, I forgot. I PreventionResourceFinder.gov. Thank you for Thank plugging you. it for No, but absolutely. <laughs> go to it. It's really remarkable. It's resources for educators, for faith-based organizations, for community activists, and it's really impressively comprehensive. Um, this has really been a, absolutely a unique overviews that you all have provided. Um, 
far richer than I thought, so I want to actually, in the last 20 minutes, turn to the audience, and especially to our students, if you have any questions. I've got a page of questions, so I can keep going. But really, this is a remarkable opportunity for you to ask uh, questions of these uh, four distinguished individuals who've served our country. Anyway, sir. Will you say who you are? What yes, you please, yeah, identify yourself and your institution of affiliation. Assuming it's on? Okay, hi. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Mauricio Alexander Cherney from American University SIS, where I'm sure you know uh, Cynthia Miller, Idris, and, and Peril. Um, I, I had a couple questions, uh, but I'll try to keep it to one. Uh, I guess my main question is part of the research that I'm doing is uh, the cycle of violence that, of course, that, we're, that you're tackling, and especially with this um, new uh, system of, of doing it in like three or four parts. The last part you mentioned on racism, so I have an interest in sort of the truth reconciliation in, in America, the education, you know, everything that's right now, I guess, polarizing a lot of our country. Does the government have any interest or input, let's say with DHS and other agencies, to also um, push, you know, agendas, because you're tackling anti-Semitism, for example, that comes with really truth-telling, right? A little bit about history, sort of making sure that disinformation is addressed. How is DHS and other organizations addressing disinformation uh, in the United States in that kind of way? I'm happy to start, and, and this basic idea of trying to foster a healthier information environment is something we are trying to support, also recognizing the role of government and what that should appropriately be in a space uh, th that is um, uh, all about allowing a wide array of, of, of ideas. So we have, including through some of the legislation secured in the first couple of years of the administration, obtained significant funding to support things like digital literacy programming. And some of that work comes from the Department of Homeland Security and some of it doesn't. So the National Science Foundation, for example, has significant funding that they have now made available in grant opportunities to try to help foster the sort of programs that could be incorporated into curricula and could allow those who spend a lot of time online especially, which is kind of all of us at this point, uh, in, in being skeptical of what they should be skeptical of and at least curious to find out more. It's just an example, I wanna let others weigh in, but the basic answer is fostering a healthier information environment online through digital literacy in other forms, such as by supporting local journalism, we're working to do always with an eye towards what the appropriate role of government is in this space. Uh, I'm a private citizen, so I get to promote certain things. Um, there is an organization called NewsGuard that is essentially a good housekeeping seal of approval for various purported news outlets. And they will, the platform has to be willing to embrace it and put it on their site. So you go to a particular platform and NewsGuard will have basically a, a, a red, yellow, or green seal on the news source you're about to open up and start reading, which can be a challenging task to identify because there are a lot of really uh, outrageous um, sources of information that look like they're legitimate. There's something called, for example, the I think it's called the, the Santa Monica Observer. Um, it is not a conventional newspaper, but it sounds like it. I hope I got that name right. And so if we can get Americans to start looking for that kind of thing when they go to a particular source of information to say, oh, that's yellow, that's not really reliable, I'm just gonna go to the next thing until I find a green uh, and be more scrutinizing of the, some of the stuff that we consume on a daily basis, I think that would go a long way. I'll just add, I think what Jay underscores here is the responsibility of citizenship. We have these first three pillars of the strategy which are very much focused on the domestic terrorist challenge, and then the fourth you raised, Josh, which is the context within which all of this is happening in our country, and what we do to get after the root causes and the fundamental issues with which we're wrestling, systemic racism, poverty, access challenges for many, uh, to the kinds of educations that would enable them to become discerning consumers of information. These are all, these are projects for us for the future. And for young people, I would say it begins with your responsibility as a citizen to secure your immediate environment, your homeland. If you have friends who you think really need help, 
It may be they are depressed. It may be they're anxious. It may be they're angry. Maybe you're worried that they're spending too much time online and they're being inspired by those who suggest that their identity will be reinforced through acts of violence. They need help. And the, the, the mil, in the military, everyone has a buddy. Your buddy looks after you, keeps you safe, you keep them safe. We need to be doing that for each other, and especially young people need to, to call it out to help their friend, to help their friend get help. We see with families and communities, they're very afraid when they have a child, a young person who's trending toward violence, to reach out because they're afraid of punitive action being taken. Of course, on the other end of something catastrophic, much more punitive action is taken against the individual and potentially the family. So it's, it's really on us individually, and I think one of the problems is that people now feel they don't have agency. Everything's happening beyond them. They don't have the, the tools to get after this. Actually, every citizen has a responsibility in this growing of a healthier country to recover from some of the damage that was done. I'll call it out honestly by a president who called people out to use violence to achieve his political objectives and has done so again quite recently. Um, with respect to the uh, legal process underway. That is something that we each need to speak out to and hold up the values of this country that will give you the freedom and choices that you expect to have as, as young Americans in your futures. Uh, hi, my name is Julian. I'm a sophomore undergraduate in the School of Foreign Service um, and a Jewish civilization minor. Um, uh, I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about prevention and the combating of domestic terror, but when you know local governments and federal government uh, fail to counter um, incidents and they occur and they happen, um, I was wondering what the process of recovery looks like, how the federal government helps in the process of recovery. Um, I was just in Charlottesville as a part of a Centennial Lab, a class that the SFS puts on. Um, and we saw that they still really haven't recovered at like a local level with their government. Um, but also, you know, in minority communities within that area, um, they're still struggling to reconcile with what has happened in, in their own city. I can, I can start with this. I'll give you Buffalo as an example uh, of where we saw a, a devastating attack a very deliberately targeted racist attack. Uh, and in the manifesto left behind by the person who uh, conducted the attack, very clear statement that he was inspired by, by great replacement theory, um, had been inspired by a foreign actor who'd done something similar. Um, and uh, uh, in that case, following the attack, what we do is we work with the state and local, especially locals, and we ask them the question, what do you need? What can we provide? Immediately what was requested was mental health support. And so that's the first thing we'll do is we'll identify through the federal enterprise, in this case it's usually the Department of Health and Human Services, how we can surge that support. There may be a lot of other things that need to be done as well. For example, this was the only supermarket in that part of town. What can we do to assist with the economic development in that community devastated by this attack? How else can we strengthen the school system in that community? What can we brought in? So we really do look to surge federal resources. However, you've put your finger on something, which is that there's so much going on and there's so many challenges in so many places that in the immediate aftermath of something, there's a big surge and a focus, and then it may dissipate. And then the community is still hurting, and they continue to need help, and they may not be able to, to secure it in the way that they initially did, also because the leadership changes in both the federal government and also in the community. So one of the things that I see in the most, most healthy communities is the work of the mayor, the work of the governor, to stay in close touch with federal counterparts and ask for that help and express the need that uh, exists, define it clearly enough that it can be brought forward for response. And it's in some ways the squeaky wheel will get the grease, that's an old fashioned expression, but when you reach out and ask for it, we'll work to get it to you. We see this whether it's in relation to a natural disaster and its aftermath or a catastrophic mass shooting. 
And so I do think that state and local leadership really matters, and the relationships between the state and locals and the federal team is a very important one to cultivate and sustain. All, all I'll, I'll add to that, you heard this from the president yesterday with respect to Tennessee. Um, I had the privilege of accompanying him down to Uvalde, and he, you heard this from him since about what he heard there. And other places where he's had to be the consoler in chief is that when it comes to the issue Secretary Johnson mentioned, people want to see action and they want to see legislation uh, that helps us address the firearm, uh, the gun violence problem that this country continues to face. Now we've made some progress over the past two years, but again, the president's been very clear that it's not nearly enough. And to the extent that there's a consistent message, you're just hearing me repeat what the president says, it's that they want action and they want Congress to work with the executive branch to make some progress in that area. And there's another example of this, which is in a different category. We've, we haven't really talked about, uh, uh, except there was a reference to um, the George Floyd verdict. Um, we also have needs to strengthen communities in the way, in the relationship between the police and the community, and to develop greater capability to uh, communicate effectively, to resolve challenges effectively at the local level to reduce the use of violence all around, some of its gun violence, some of its excessive police action. There are lots of programs, you're very familiar with them, Mary, um, in the Justice Department that we have pushed to advance and push out into communities in our two plus years in service to really provide a lot more support uh, from Vanita Gupta and her team. Uh, right now, for example, we're dealing with violence um, uh, from a, um, an, a movement that is seeking the autonomy of a particular state in India from the unitary country of India and that has uh, uh, attacked a consulate in San Francisco. Um, we have sent in a community relations service team to work in the Sikh community in San Francisco to look at ways to de-escalate the situation and promote more dialogue and less resort to violence. That's the kind of work we've got to do to reweave the fabric of our country, literally, to find other ways for people to address their differences and not choose violence as the means to the end. If I could just, and I know we, we need to get more questions. I think that this issue of the distrust of law enforcement and government in general um, is one of the most significant barriers to making the kind of pro progress that you're talking about. Having been working in this space both in government and now for six years outside of government, uh, oftentimes, frankly, because of my previous role, I'm asked to be the interlocutor between people who don't talk to each other, right? Can you tell the government? Can you tell the law enforcement? And this is not just from one side of the political spectrum. The distrust is on both sides. Uh, on, the, on the far right, we have like undermining government process is undermining dem democracy. We're supporting the police when we want to support the police. We're attacking the police when it's in our benefit to attack the police. On the left side of the political spectrum, the distrust of law enforcement is so great, and you and I talked about this when I saw you recently, that uh, many people would rather see no movement, they're paralyzed because they're worried that giving any additional tools to law enforcement or to the government means those tools are gonna to be misused against black and brown communities and other marginalized communities. And we are at a point where almost any sort of idea for moving forward with policy changes, laws, et cetera, to try to make progress, to try to create moral equivalency across acts of violence is met with opposition. and. Um, I actually think this is an area, and it can't be, I mean, I appreciate everything government's doing, and when I was in government, I was part of those efforts, but I was recently at a convening just last week with a whole lot of activists on the ground saying, we don't like the term outreach, right? Because outreach suggests, now I don't know, you may or may not agree with this, but outreach suggests dis, you know, disequal positions of power and authority, and that outreach is from the one with the higher authority to the one with the lower. That means coming up with new terms, coming up with new verbiage, coming up with new yeah, tape. Yes, it's, it's horizontal. It's I did too, I did too. And I don't know that this is a widely held view, but I heard it from more than one person. So it's a super big challenge because this distrust runs so deep even including of government when, when I think they believe that the government actors are on the sort of correct side of things, it still is a real significant issue. And I think more resources need to get put into changing that dynamic. Great. Yes. 
Hi, my name's Sabrina. I'm a sophomore in the undergrad school of foreign service. Um, my question kind of to your point has to do with terminology. Um, I was actually pretty surprised to hear that this is an event focusing on domestic terrorism because especially being in the school of foreign service, domestic terrorism is not something we talk about that much. Um, and I wouldn't say there's like a widely, a wide acceptance of that term. Um, we kind of tend to put like mass shootings in this country in their own category. And I think people have a very hard time assigning the term terrorism or terrorist to it. Um, and so whether like from the perspective of a citizen or from government, I wonder what you guys think about um, what should be our approach in, you know, being comfortable with calling this acts of, these acts of terrorism because that's what they are, um, and how you know we can get people to see them as such. Can I just kick it off? Let me just uh, root this in the United States Code <laughs> because we have definitions of terrorism there, domestic and international. And the defini definitions are almost identical save for one difference, right? It's a crime of violence that's dangerous to human life that is done with the intent to intimidate or coerce a civilian population or influence a policy of government through intimidation or coercion. The only difference is that international terrorism, by definition, has some sort of connection internationally. Oftentimes that means it's motivated by a foreign terrorist organization like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. But it doesn't mean it has to occur overseas, as you all probably know if you're in the School of Foreign Service. It can occur right here in the United States, um, such as the shooting in San Bernardino on behalf of ISIS or the shooting at the Pulse nightclub uh, in Orlando that was done supposedly in furtherance of the goals of ISIS. It's called international terrorism because it's done to further goals of a foreign terrorist organization even though it occurs domestically. Whereas the definition of domestic terrorism, exact same definition in all respects, except that it occurs wholly domestically without this international connection. So the, it's super confusing. The lines don't really make any sense anymore. They're hard for people to understand. And here's a really good example. If the El Paso shooter, does everybody remember the El Paso shooting, right? Shooting at a Walmart, motivated by an extremist who was worried about great replacement theory. He was worried about a Latino invasion across the southern border. He left a manifesto praising other extremists around the world, including the Christchurch shooter. Uh, if he had pledged Bayat to a Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the former leader of ISIS who was still alive at the time, before he committed his shooting, he, he would have been charged with international terrorism. Uh, not the crime of that, but attempt to provide a material support to a foreign terrorist organization, maybe terrorism transcending national boundaries, other crimes that we think of as international terrorism. But he didn't. He did it for white supremacist reasons, ideologically motivated, done to intimidate and coerce, done to influence the policy of government through intimidation or coercion, but there's no crime of terrorism in the US code that's called terrorism that applies to that because it's done with a firearm, um, it's not done on behalf of a foreign terrorist organization, it's not directed directly at US nationals. So we have a gap there and an inequality that I think is partly uh, historic and partly um, uh, something that, that causes the, the uh, effects you were just talking about. Um, I think that's changing over time because now people in government are m including the um, attorney general, including people, in the president, the, everyone here I'm with, although Jay's not in government anymore, um, are willing to call things domestic terrorism that they didn't used to call domestic terrorism. But I think it's still a source of confusion and I think it also um, reflects biases within the country and um, and uh, and this is a whole other subject we could get onto, and a really sort of overly expansive view of the First Amendment uh, to protect certain types of speech. It does protect hate speech. It doesn't protect violence or incitement to imminent violence. So I, <clears throat> I have a view about this. Um, <clears throat> you, you asked about the terminology. <clears throat> I think it's also important to discuss are existing and available legal authorities. We have the ability to designate a foreign terrorist organization, a foreign terrorist organization. The State Department does that. That comes with a whole arsenal of things that we can do to degrade that organization. When you designate 
an organization, an FTO, they're effectively radioactive. You can be prosecuted for material support to that group. You can have your assets seized if you're associated with that group. And I know Mary's written and spoke a lot about this. To go down that road when it comes to domestic, or perceived domestic terrorist organizations, I think would be a real mistake because of the First Amendment, because of the freedom to associate in this country, and because of our own history. One man's, one person's counterterrorism tool could be another official's tool for political persecution or gaining political points. Just think back to the mindset in the place where they work now that existed in June 2020, three years ago. And the then president's belief that he could designate Antifa to be a terrorist organization, which is just totally wrong. And let's not forget, part of our history includes efforts to persecute the NAACP in the 50s and 60s. As I said in my commencement address here, seven years ago, my own grandfather was a sociologist who had an FBI file, and it's public. First thing you look at is a document from J. Edgar Hoover to the Washington field office, go investigate this guy, Charles Johnson. And the response came back three weeks later. He's a fine, upstanding man with an re impeccable reputation, but he does tend to associate with people with grievances. That would be other black people, yes, <laughs> right. And uh, my own grandfather had to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee to deny he was a member of the Communist Party. So the tools we have, the tools we think about having so often assume a wise, mature, level-headed official that can use them. And we've learned just in recent history that we cannot always count on that. Dr. Sherwood Randall and Dr. Geltzer, any closing remarks? Because we're going to probably have to cut this short. We do need to, to bring this to a close, but I just I want to resonate with what Jay has just said. That's where we started, and I described the president's guidance. We wrestle with this. You've asked such an excellent question, Sabrina. And when we began our work, we described this as domestic violent extremism. Uh, not every mass shooting is necessarily domestic terrorism. I tried to explain in a very brief way that continuum that we see. Um, there are commonalities, but some are clearly about trying to use violence to achieve a political outcome. That is where you get to the breaking of the norm and the incitement to terror, to intimidate and coerce and achieve a goal that is not consistent with the way in which we govern ourselves. And so we will continue to wrestle with terminology. You should keep asking really good questions of us. Uh, and we'll try to get this right so that what we do is build more consensus as a nation around who we are not. And that is we are not a nation that chooses to use violence uh, to choose our future leaders or keep leaders in office. That we're a nation that respects those individual freedoms and the rights that uh, are associated with them because we use them with re in a responsible way. And, and all, uh, there's so much to your question, we all want a piece of it because there's so much there, but uh, you know, the, as, as, you've, as you've heard, the, there are things that fall under our federal statutory definition of domestic terrorism. And at the same time, we're, we have the privilege of having this conversation in the context of the Second Summit for Democracy. And part of why we, we wanted to surface these issues with such wonderful interlocutors is because we are not alone as a democracy in facing hate-fueled violence, various forms of, of hate, just as Mary said at the outset, but hate-fueled violence as a threat to public safety, of course, and also to the fabric of democracy itself. Sometimes they're purely domestic incarnations of that with analogs or parallels in other countries. There are some transnational networks that transcend national boundaries, and there's inspiration of the type Mary mentioned, the, the El Paso shooter uh, alluded to. But collectively, it, it was important to us uh, as a government to make clear that as we talk about challenges that democracies need to confront individually and together, if they are to persist and strengthen as we hope and expect them to do in the years to come, that this challenge, the challenge of hate-fueled uh, violence, had to be front and center. So thank you for the privilege of getting to talk about it here.
like I'm sorry, all of our closest allies are wrestling with the same issues. So the like-minded democracies uh, that we work with are, are challenged in the same ways, are asking the same questions, are trying to find a way forward that gets that balance right. So we also work very closely with them. Well, unfortunately, we're not only out of time, but we're over time. Uh, so let me thank all of you, firstly, for carving out time of your day to come and be part of the Summit for Democracy, and especially to attend this very remarkable uh, discussion. And thank you, too, for your excellent questions that significantly enriched the discussion. They certainly you know, blew away all the questions that I would have asked uh, if we had more time. I hope you'll join me in thanking Mary McCord, Secretary Johnson, Dr. Sherwood Randall, and Dr. Geltzer for their remarkable candor, uh, for their insights, and indeed, all of them for their service to our country.